Coming up on this episode of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show, we talk about Ghostbusters losing over $70 million, David Fincher in talks for World War Z 2, and several Star Wars news bits that'll make you happy, excited, and sad. So it's all coming up on this episode of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. Get ready for the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show, featuring the latest news about the movies you want to see. Starting in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello everybody, welcome to a very late episode of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. Let me look this up, we are at episode 14 for August 18th, 2016. Now, yes, this is coming out on a Thursday. I usually like to have my shows, my Alexander Robinson Movie News Show episodes to come out on either Sunday or or Monday, uh, because it's like kind of a wrap-up of the previous week in terms of movies. But I was out of town uh, on Sunday, so I had no means of recording a show. And then on Monday, I had a busy day at work. Uh, so I just didn't have the time or the energy to really record an episode. So I apologize, but you know what? It's getting here now. I'm recording it. And holy crap, there is a lot to talk about that happened last week, including one bit of news that um, I didn't talk about at all for some strange reason. I'm not exactly sure why, but anyway, let's get into this right now. Uh, there is a shit ton of news to talk about. Let's start off with a trailer. We'll start the show with a trailer. And we'll end the show with the trailer. I think that sounds about good. Anyway, here we are talking about, right now, the announcement trailer for Dunkirk, which is the upcoming Christopher Nolan film. And I saw this trailer uh, in front of Suicide Squad, uh, which is probably the best part about seeing Suicide Squad to begin with, uh, um, outside the fact that I did not get to see it uh, alone. I... Got to see it uh, with a bunch of my friends from work, and we all got tortured by watching it. Huh? But anyway, this is a movie that's set in World War II, and it takes place during the Dunkirk evacuation, uh, which pretty much is a big event uh, in France. Huh? And the movie stars uh, people like Kenneth Branagh, Tom Hardy, Cillian Murphy... Mark Rylance, it has a fair amount of well-known actors and very talented actors, uh, but I don't have much from this trailer to really add. I mean, I hope it looks good. Uh, I mean, I, I hope it is good, but the reason I don't have much to say about this trailer is because it reminds me a lot of the first trailer for Interstellar, where everyone was really excited for it, and I was excited too, but the announcement trailer was just stock footage of corn space and Matthew McConaughey's narration and this trailer just doesn't have much either it just has some neat shots of the soldiers uh, and one shot where they hear something coming in and they're all trying to duck and cover so kind of impressive but it's not much to really judge a movie on and this doesn't come out until July 21st of next year but I'm looking forward to this I'm I think, okay, here's the thing. Christopher Nolan is an excellent filmmaker. I think, like, the way he makes movies is just so masterful. Uh, from The Dark Knight, Memento, and Inception. But I feel like his last two movies, The Dark Knight Rises and Interstellar, he really dropped the ball on both of them. Uh, with The Dark Knight Rises... It seemed like he really didn't have his heart in the right place. And, like, he was basically forced to make that movie. Uh, because there are a lot of things that are admittedly very good. 
But then there are other things in it that piss you off and make no sense and you wish could have been dealt with better. And then with Interstellar, uh, it was good, really good for the first two hours of the movie. And then the last, I'd say, 49 minutes comes in and you're like, what in the shit is going on here? This is like... Like, the last 40 minutes is so confusing, so nonsensical, and just so downright stupid uh, that it almost ruins the whole movie. But, I will say, in all fairness, I've only seen Interstellar once, and the only way I saw Interstellar was at the Chinese theater uh, in IMAX, uh, and I sat in the second row, meaning I had to look straight up when watching the entire movie. So maybe my perception of Interstellar will change when I watch it like from a normal perspective. Because, I mean, I've only seen it once. I want to give it another chance. Huh? But um, I mean, not much else to say. Uh, I hope uh, Dunkirk is good. Um, if, like, if there's anything to expect from a Christopher Nolan movie... Yeah? Uh, even if it ends up being bad, at least it'll have amazing cinematography. He's shooting it in IMAX again. Uh, the actors are really good, and it's going to have a great Hans Zimmer score. Uh, because as much as like sometimes I get tired of Hans Zimmer, he at the very least works very well with Christopher Nolan. Like the best, his best scores come from when he's working with Christopher Nolan, I think. Uh, like, the Interstellar score, as much as I'm, like, kind of eh on that movie at the moment, uh, I absolutely love that score. But moving on, let's get into some more news. And there's, like I said, a crap ton of stories to talk about. Uh, some some that'll make you happy, some that'll make you sad, uh, some that'll confuse you. Uh, let's, let's just start right now, huh? Let's talk about Ghostbusters. Well, as we all know, the reboot came out last month, and it was not as bad as we thought it was going to be. Hell, I'd even go as far to say that it was decent. Very, very decent. But uh, it turns out that the sequel that Sony said is definitely going to happen might not actually happen. And even worse, uh, the movie is suffering from... Well, this this story comes from the Hollywood Reporter, and it says Ghostbusters heading for seventy million dollar plus loss uh, sequel unlikely. Uh, I think there have been other reports that it's now lost a hundred million dollars, uh, but it, it's just kind of sad. I mean, the movie definitely could have been much better. Like they could have done away with anything that reminded us of the original Ghostbusters. Like, you didn't need Slimer, you didn't need a Stave Puff Marshmallow Man balloon, you didn't need cameos from the original cast. Like, it could have worked on its own, huh? But anyway, here's what the story says. Immediately upon the opening of Ghostbusters in mid-July, top Sony executives boldly declared a sequel to Paul Feig's all-female reboot of Ivan Reitman's 1984 classic was a given. Quote, while nothing has been officially announced yet, there's no doubt in my mind it'll happen. Closed quote. And this comes from Roy Burr, who's the president of Worldwide Distribution at Sony. That was the studio's last public mention of a sequel. As of August 7th, Ghostbusters has earned under $180 million at the global box office, including $117 million domestically. The film still hasn't opened in a few markets, including France, Japan, and Mexico, but box office experts say that it will have trouble getting to $225 million despite a hefty net production budget of... 144 million plus a big marketing spend. Sony hardly is alone in suffering from audience rejection of sequels this summer. But film chief Tom Rothman and his team, along with partner Village Roadside, had high hopes for launching a live action Ghostbusters cinematic universe. And universe is in quotes. Now they are prepping for steep losses and an uncertain future for the franchise. So, I mean, it is kind of sad. In a way, because I did enjoy the new Ghostbusters. Uh, um, but at the same time, like, it just, like, really goes to show... I, I think the problem, like, was just all on marketing. Because the trailers looked god-awful. The trailers absolutely 
looked terrible, and they made you want to claw your own eyes out. Uh, and to add insult to injury, quite literally, uh, whenever anyone criticized the movie before coming out, uh, even me, uh, the cast and director would immediately go to the notion of, oh, you're a sexist, you're a sexist pig, you don't think women can do uh, what men can do. And to an extent, that's like kind of true. Like The people out there who only hated the Ghostbusters because it was women, yeah, they, they deserve to be shun and called out. Huh? But I think they just failed to understand that people didn't like the trailers because it didn't look funny. And that's what Ghostbusters was supposed to be. It was all about the jokes. And it even got to a point where I've heard stories that um, people had their Twitter accounts suspended just for talking shit about Ghostbusters, like whether before it came out or the fact that it wasn't doing very well. So that's really shitty. So, I mean, just like a heads up, like if you want people to see your movie, don't insult them and try to have a better marketing team in terms of your trailers because like it it'll definitely help most of the time. I think this Ghostbusters, while it might not be getting a sequel, I think it is kind of an interesting landmark in terms of like like hype for a movie or like just backlash before a movie comes out and how you should not criticize the people you're trying to win over. Um, but let's stay in the realm of Sony and talk about um, some other bad news for them. Uh, this comes, again, from the Hollywood Reporter. Reporter. Por okay, okay. This comes from the Hollywood Reporter, not Porner. Um, and it's about the rumored 23 or 21 Jump Street slash Men in Black crossover. Which, I gotta say, when I first heard about this, uh, like, I don't remember when it was. I think it may have been two years ago. I was like, okay, that's a joke. Uh, you no, know, yeah, it must have been two years ago because it was during the Sony hack. I was thinking, okay, this has got to be a joke. There's no way they're making that movie. Yeah? And then as time went on, it's just, like, we heard more confirmation. I'm like, oh, shit. This is not a joke. They really are so desperate that they're crossing over two franchises that have nothing to do with each other at all. Like, the only reason a crossover like that would even ever happen is because Sony owns the rights to both of them. Now, for something like Alien vs. Predator, that makes somewhat legitimate sense. I mean, yes, Fox does own both Alien and Predator, but at the very least, there was that tease in Predator 2, and there were the Dark Horse comics uh, throughout the 90s. Uh. But anyway, back to this 21 Jump Street Men in Black crossover. It seems like it it won't get made. I mean, this comes from The Hollywood Reporter, as I said. And the headline says, Jonah Hill doubts 23 Jump Street Men in Black crossover movie will get made. For some time, Sony has been tossing around the idea of a crossover movie featuring two of their biggest comedy franchises, 21 Jump Street and Men in Black. But Jump Street star Jonah Hill now says a merging of the movies is unlikely to happen. I had the idea, Hill told the Toronto Sun, but I doubt that movie will get made. The idea of a Jump Street Men in Black crossover first came to public light via the Sony email hacks in 2014. Okay, so I'm right there. In March of this year, The Hollywood Reporter exclusively reported that Muppets director James Bobbin, who also directed my least favorite movie of the year so far, Alice Through the Looking Glass, was in early talks to helm the movie. And in April, Sony teased that the film was tentatively titled MIB 23. But now Jonah Hill says he thinks the film would be too complicated to make work. They're trying to make all the deals, but it's kind of impossible with all the Men in Black stuff. The Jump Street films were so much fun. The Jump Street films were so fun to make, and the whole joke of them was they were making fun of remakes and sequels and reboots, and then now it's going to become a giant sequel reboot. It's almost become what we were making fun of, and it's hard to maintain that joke when it such high stakes. So yeah, I, I figured that the Men in Black 21 Jump Street crossover was a complete act of desperation. No need to make it at all. I don't have much more to say. If this thing is dead, then good. We don't need it. Because I don't think Men in Black is really 
I don't think people are really clamoring for a Men in Black movie unless, like, uh, I was about to say unless Will Smith's in it, but um, even then, I don't think, because Men in Black 3 was okay. The best part about that movie was uh, Josh Brolin doing his best Tommy Lee Jones impression. That was awesome, but the rest of the movie was very much like, look, we don't have much of a clever idea here. We just want to make another movie. Here you go. Take it or leave it. But yeah, that's, I mean... If it's dead, not a big loss there. Now, let's talk about a bit of news that actually is somewhat interesting. Uh, let's talk about uh, World War Z, uh, which is a movie that I've only seen once and I think was much better than I anticipated it to be. Uh, um, basically, it's that zombie movie with Brad Pitt. Uh, so, there's like a search for the director and Brad Pitt is currently trying to get David Fincher for the World War Z sequel. Huh? If there is really something to help make your film get better, then maybe going for a really great director like David Fincher would be the job to do it. So this article comes from Variety. After losing director J.A. Bayana to Jurassic Park 5, Brad Pitt is zeroing in on an old friend for the World War Z sequel. Sources have told Variety that Pitt, along with Paramount and Skydance, is in talks with David Fincher to direct the follow-up to the 2013 smash hit. Pitt, who's returning to star in and produced the next World War Z installment, recently met with a handful of other directors, but is said to be zeroing in on Fincher for the pick, which is expected to start filming in early 2017. Skydance and Paramount have no comment on the development. <clears throat> so, I think this is a really great idea, because, I mean, for one thing, Brad Pitt is producing it, and he and David Fincher do have a really good, like, working relationship, because they've done stuff like Seven, what's in the box, what's in the fucking box, man, uh, Fight Club, which you never talk about, and then the Curious Case of Benjamin Button, so they have really turned out a lot of great products together, and, I mean, David Fincher... With the exception of Alien 3, he makes a bunch of really good stuff. So, I'm really curious to see what happens here. Like, the two of them work well together. As I've said, David Fincher is a really great director. Uh, I hope this thing works out. Like, if, if David Fincher does direct this, then I'm seeing this no matter what. Because I'm sure he'll do a damn good job with it. Uh, and make it much better than the first movie. And if he's not on board, then... Whatever, and I'm not, I don't, I doubt I'll be seeing uh, the next World War Z movie because I enjoyed the first one, but I don't think I love it enough to really want to see it again. I know there's an extended cut, but uh, I don't know. So let's move on to um, something uh, interesting that came out last week, uh, which is an open letter to Warner Brothers CEO about layoffs and Zack Snyder. So there's been this open letter going around uh, from a former Warner Brothers employee um, talking about how frustrated they were about the fact that Warner Brothers like has a lot of bad decisions going on, and yet a lot of other people are getting laid off instead of like the people who should really be held responsible, particularly Zack Snyder, who is pretty much the guy who's taking on all the big, important properties in the DC Extended Universe. Huh? The, this letter is really long. It's much longer than I actually thought it was. Huh? But you can go look for it on um, pajiba.com. Huh? Or just Google Open Letter to Warner Brothers about Zack Snyder. But I'll read one segment that I found interesting. I got back from my screening and dusted this sucker off. And, and this person's referring to Suicide Squad. You, your executive team, and the vision of your extraordinary storytellers that resulted in the loss of around 1,000 jobs seem intent on crashing the ship into as much shit as you can find in the ocean by making insane decisions over and over again. Zack Snyder is not delivering. Is he being punished? Assistants who were doing fantastic work certainly were. People in finance and in marketing and in IT. 
They had no say in a movie called Batman vs. Superman only having eight minutes of Batman fighting Superman in it that ends because their moms have the same name. Snyder is a producer on every DC movie. He is still directing Justice League. He is being rewarded with more opportunity to get more people laid off. I'm assuming you yourself haven't been financially affected in any real way. You and your studio are the biggest lesson about life one can learn. The top screws up and the bottom suffers. Peter Jackson phones it in and a marketing supervisor has to figure out a plan B for house payments. Your uneven Hall H presentation at Comic-Con this year was a ridiculous mess that ranged from rushed to boring. When Marvel announced their full slate of films with a fun fan event several years ago, you announced yours on a shareholder conference call. You just don't get it, and it's not just DC movies. It's your whole slate. Jupiter Ascending, Get Hard, Hot Pursuit, Max, Vacation, Pan, Point Break. Fucking Pan, you jerk. People lost their jobs and you decided Pan was a good idea? You think another Jungle Book is a good idea? So, I mean, there's more to this letter. Uh, so I just wanted to read uh, like the segments that I found particularly interesting. So, I mean... <sighs> This is just interesting, um, and it's it's kind of true. Like I don't know like the whole facts because I don't work at Warner Brothers, uh, but like I could definitely like see it through Batman vs Superman because there were reports that Batman vs Superman had to cross the billion dollar mark in order for it to be a true success, uh, and I think there were there were talks about layoffs uh, unless it did cross the billion dollar mark, uh, and it didn't. It only ended its theatrical run with $872 million worldwide, and yeah, Zack Snyder's still directing Justice League. I mean, the trailer does look somewhat promising, but after seeing Suicide Squad, I just don't know, like, what to believe anymore. Like, I I don't know if I have faith, because, like, Suicide Squad was worse. <laughs> Even though the Wonder Woman and Justice League trailers look good, like, am I going to be fooled into this again? Is this just going to be another one of those instances where it's like, oh man, these trailers look cool, and then you see the movie, it's like, fuck! I don't, I really don't know the situation, so I'm going to leave this as it is. You can go find the open letter for yourself and, um, like, read it, because it is rather interesting. So, with that said, let's take a break, because I need to relax a little bit, since we have quite a few more news stories to get through. So I'll be right back. Love what I'm doing on this channel? Love watching movie reviews, let's plays, or podcasts? Want to help the channel grow even further? Then you can go over to patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson and give out a monthly donation and you'll help the channel grow. In return, you'll get special rewards such as access to retro reviews, let's plays, and podcasts before anyone else does. And if you don't want to donate or can't donate, then hey, that's perfectly awesome. You get awesome content regardless. But the really cool thing is you can donate maybe as little as a penny. You can donate a penny a month if you want. So, I mean, any little bit will do and your support is greatly appreciated. So again, that's patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Go over there and donate. Help this channel grow. Uh, again, patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Alright, we are back, and let's talk about the remaining stories here. Let's start off with the world of Marvel, or more specifically, Captain Marvel. So back at Comic-Con, Brie Larson was officially confirmed to be Carol Danvers, a.k.a. Captain Marvel. So now we have a bit of information on her origin story within the Captain Marvel solo movie. And this story comes from Slash Film, which the story does actually say that um, Joe and Anthony Russo accidentally revealed that Captain Marvel will appear in Avengers Age of Ultron, Age of Ultron, sorry, Avengers Infinity War, which as you know is going to be one movie now instead of two, so that's going to be good, huh? I'm glad that we'll get to see Captain Marvel early before her own movie, just like we did with Black Panther in Civil War. But anyway, uh, concerning her origin story, 
it seems like it's going to be tweaked a little bit because the headline here says Captain Marvel origin story will be changed a bit thanks to another superhero origin story. So the co-writer for Captain Marvel, Nicole Perlman, who co-wrote Guardians of the Galaxy with James Gunn, said that there are going to be slight changes to her origin story. And she says, quote, I don't think I've ever had a project where I've been more mindful about the impact that it could have and the importance of it. She's such an incredibly kick-ass character, and Kelly Sue DeConnick did a great run with her story arc recently. But here's the thing. If you were just going to do a straight adaptation of the comics, her origin story is very similar to Green Lantern. And obviously, that's not what we want to do. There's a lot of reinvention that needs to happen. And also, she's her own person, and she's a great character. We have to be aware of what's happened in other Marvel films and make sure that her particular storyline is unique, fun, and also fits in with in this world that's going on at the same time. It's a little bit of an interesting story gauntlet. It's been good to have a partner. It's been an incredible experience. If we can pull it off, it could be an incredibly important but also really fun and kick-ass superhero film. So, I... Am not one to really nitpick about this. I mean, I would like it if superhero movies stayed as close to the source material as they can. But if you have to make changes, especially with a complicated world like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have to make changes for the sake of like making sense in the universe. Because with Winter Soldier, for example, Captain America the Winter Soldier, like the two storylines are actually quite different. Civil War is completely different. Ultron's origin story is different. There are a lot of differences between the comic books and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Hell, I mean, Iron Man 3, which is more or less an adaptation of Iron Man Extremis, is quite different from Extremis. Huh? So I don't totally blame them for trying to change the origin story. And also, I can understand because I think people might still have the bad taste of Green Lantern in their mouths um so it'll, it'll be an interesting way to go because as i've said before marvel's made 13 movies all of them have been good at worst is thor the dark world which is enjoyable but forgettable so i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they know what they're doing so i'm not totally worried in this scenario uh, and that's pretty much all I have to say. I'm looking forward to seeing Brie Larson as Captain Marvel. I'm really happy that she's going to be in Avengers Infinity War first. And, I don't know, the future looks bright for the MCU. So, let's move on from the Marvel Cinematic Universe to a galaxy far, far away. And let's talk about the Han Solo movie that's coming out. And the fact that we will be able to see Lando Calrissian. This story comes from EmpireOnline.com, and pretty much it just says Lando Calrissian will appear in Young Han Solo movie. The character of Lando Calrissian, originally played by Billy D. Williams in Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, was portrayed as an old friend of Han Solo, and it's implied that the two embarked on many adventures together. So it makes sense that a Han Solo origin story would follow Lando. There's no word on who might be filling the role, though according to some reports, an early frontrunner seems to have emerged in Donald Glover, who would certainly have the smooth-talking charisma required, but we are firmly in rumor and hearsay territory here. So, I... Here's the thing. Like with Han Solo, um, Lando Calrissian has only been played by one actor, Billy D. Williams, and Billy D. Williams nails the character of Lando Calrissian. So it's just really hard to imagine anybody who could take on that role. Because like I've said with superhero movies, with someone like Batman, Superman, or Spider-Man, there have been different actors and different runs of the character that it's always nice to see a new interpretation because you're wondering what they're going to do. With Star Wars, on the other hand... A majority of these characters have only been played by one actor in live action, uh, and it's all in one continuity. There's not, like, a different universe of Star Wars. Uh, so it's really hard to imagine anyone else but those original actors. Like, as much faith as I have in Phil Lord and Chris Miller and Aldrin 
Ererich. His last name always escapes me on how you pronounce it, but basically, the guy who's now playing Han Solo, like, I have complete faith in them. Huh? It's just I'm worried, like, how they're going to do. And Donald Glover, yeah, he's got charisma, and he seems like he would be the guy for the job. Huh? But it's just hard to picture anybody but Billy D. Williams in the role of Lando Calrissian. So this is something that, I, once again, I'm just going to lay back and see what happens. So, um, yeah, not much else to say there. I'm hoping for the best. And we, unfortunately, have to wait until 2018 to see this Han Solo movie. So we'll see what happens. But with Han and Lando together, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Now let's, let's, let's talk about something sad. So just when I thought that we had slowed down on celebrity deaths, 2016 rears its ugly head again and takes away R2-D2. This report comes from CNN.com, which says Kenny Baker, Star Wars R2-D2 actor, dies. So this story actually came from Sunday, August 14th. And it's, it's just sad. Um... Here's what the story says. Kenny Baker, the British actor who gave life to the droid R2-D2 in the Star Wars films, has died at the age of 81, according to his niece, Abigail Shield. Baker was being looked after by Shield's brother, who found him Saturday morning. Shield said Baker was ill for years with a lung condition. She also said her uncle, who was three feet tall, who was three feet eight inches tall, did not expect to live past his teenage years because he was a little person, so... It is pretty amazing he lived this long. Baker died in his sleep Saturday morning, according to his nephew and caregiver, Andrew Meyer Co Myers Cough. Huh? That was Baker's wish, to go peacefully, his nephew said. I couldn't ask for more. Up until his final moments, Baker was in good spirits and was watching the Olympics on television. To think about R2-D2, uh, like, when you think about, it, like, yeah, there's, like, animatronic R2-D2 is going around, but what Kenny Baker did, like, he really gave more life to R2-D2 than any animatronic could give, because he would, like, wobble around inside the suit, which gives R2-D2 a little more personality in his body movements. So basically, when R2-D2 was not uh, rolling around or moving, uh, when he was stationary with just two legs instead of three, uh, that's when Kenny Baker's... Uh, acting would come into play and I, I would say acting because if it was enough to bring R2-D2 to life then he definitely did a damn good job. Rest in peace Kenny Baker. Um, let's move on to something a little more hopeful um, and involves Star Wars Episode 8. So pretty much uh, last month the film wrapped production. It wrapped and now it's starting to go into the editing process and it's been reported that John Williams will be um, scoring the movie within a couple of weeks. This story comes from ComingSoon.net, and it pretty much says, Lucasfilm Star Wars Episode Eight officially wrapped filming uh, in July. Come on. It's, uh, it's oh, come on, my page just, like, all the text disappeared on this page. Come on. I need to do a show. Thank you, iPad. Um... Anyway, Lucasfilm Star Wars Episode 8 officially wrapped filming on July 22nd after over five months of shooting, yet legendary composer John Williams told a crowd gathering to see him lead the Boston Pops at Tanglewood last night said that he will get to screen an early cut in just a few weeks. God damn it, the iPad... Oh, it came back, huh? But that, that's pretty much it. I don't have much to say... I don't have much else to say there. So... Here's so, so I think it's really exciting that, I mean, John Williams is still having the energy to score the episodic Star Wars films, uh, and I hope I hope he lives to score Episode Nine, uh, because in terms of the episodic Star Wars movies, um, like you could just have like one more, which is Episode Nine, and then <clears throat> that's all done at least until John Boyega, Daisy Ridley, and Oscar Isaac grow up to be uh, much older, and then we have to make new episodic films when they're older. But, I mean, we'll see what happens there. Now, my big concern with this, however, while there, I have really nothing bad to say, um, back in February, it was confirmed that Episode 8 would be moved into December. And 
given the fact that the movie's already wrapped, it's already being edited, and John Williams is about to score the movie, why exactly was this moved to December? Because, like, it... At, because at this rate, I feel like it could be completed by the time May rolls around, which is the traditional release date for a Star Wars movie. And I think the reasoning behind the December push may have been because The Force Awakens made over $2 billion. It was the only movie uh, besides Avatar to make $2 billion on its original run. So maybe that's the reason. If it is, I don't blame them. Because after The Force Awakens, I am kind of on that idea of maybe December should be the new month for Star Wars releases now because The Force Awakens really was a great way to end the year and um, Star Wars just always leaves a good feeling in my heart unless of course it's Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones but I'm not one to judge here like I doubt they're gonna change the release date back to me because that release date is now um, occupied by the fifth Pirates of the Caribbean movie, which I heard rumor today that that movie cost $320 million to make. So, I mean, I'm not saying anything until there's like actual confirmation, but $320 million? <sighs> Whatever, moving on. Let's move on to the final bit of news here, which is probably the biggest trailer to come out uh, last week, which was the next official trailer for Star Wars Rogue One. And it was really cool. There are a lot of things in the trailer that I really liked. Uh, um, I think the look of the movie still looks really good. Uh, it's got a little more grit than The Force Awakens did. The acting does seem to be a little better this time around, uh, because one... As much as I liked the first trailer for Rogue One, the acting did leave me a little concerned. But it's got some really great shots. One of my favorite shots is um, the Death Star basically blocking out the sun of a planet it's nearby. And there's even a shot where like the Death Star appears to be upside down. But it could very well be that the Death Star is underneath a planet. I love seeing the traditional T-65 X-Wings. It just has a really great look to it. And I also love seeing the classic Stormtrooper armor. And for the big thing that everyone was talking about in this trailer, uh, the final shot with Darth Vader, I'm really glad that um, they didn't show Darth Vader throughout the whole trailer except for that one part. Because even though like we all know Darth Vader is going to be in the movie, we know what he looks like. I am glad that they didn't show him that much. And I hope that in the movie he doesn't play that significant of a role. I mean, okay, you know what? Let me rephrase that. I have a feeling that he's going to play an important part in the movie, but his role will be rather small because when your plot is revolved around stealing plans for the Death Star... It's really hard to do that without Darth Vader at least knowing about this because he is Darth Vader. It's really it would be really weird if he didn't know about this at all. So he might appear in snippets, but I am glad that he's being voiced by James Earl Jones once again because I mean in terms of the movies, you can't get anyone besides James Earl Jones to play Darth Vader. So that's the tr so those are my thoughts on the trailer for Rogue One. I actually like this a tad better than the first one. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm also really nervous because, like with all movies, it could easily be bad. But I think in terms of the Marvel and Star Wars properties, Disney has a lot more respect um, for it. So hopefully it will not get screwed up. I'm hoping for the best. So that does it for all the news. Let's talk about the Blu-rays that came out this week. Huh? And it's a handful of stuff. We have um, Angry Birds, which I actually did not know that this movie was coming out on Blu-ray already. Because it came out in May. Usually movies that come out in like May don't get a Blu-ray release until September or October. So this is like really quick. But uh, this is the movie based off the iPhone app of the same name. I didn't see this because um, I was 
too addicted to playing the app again just because the movie came out. And then after the movie kind of disappeared, I kind of stopped playing Angry Birds. So, not much else to say there. We have the second season of Gotham on Blu-ray, which I have not seen. Uh, I've only seen the first episode of Gotham. I reviewed it, and it was just like, eh, whatever. I heard it got better, but I just don't have the time to rewatch it. And plus, I feel like like with DC, I'm just getting too much Batman overdose. Uh, but that's just my opinion. We also have Once Upon a Time Season 5. From the Criterion Collection, we have... Uh, where is... Oh, my iPad's acting up. Uh, okay. From the Criterion Collection, we have In Her Own Words... And I think this is a legit release. Uh, Raiders, the story of the greatest fan film ever made, which I did a review on. And not only did I review that movie, uh, it got retweeted by the actual guys who made the movie. So I'm like, wow, that's really cool. So you can check out my review on my channel there. But we also have stuff like uh, Hell on Wheels Season 5 Volume 1. The 11th season of The Vampire Diaries. Wow, I didn't even know it was going on for that long. And, uh, God's Not Dead 2, which I heard was bullshit, but it's a faith-based movie, so I can't really say I'm surprised there, but that pretty much is it for all the Blu-ray releases this week. And nothing too exciting, but once again, um, the more exciting Blu-ray releases come out, uh, in September, during the fall season. Next week, there are... A few interesting things here, whether or not that's a good thing is to be determined. Wait a minute. Oh, that's coming out on Blu-ray next week. Okay. So, I mean, I'll talk about it next week, uh, but there's one, maybe two things that I'm really looking forward to. So, that's the show. I apologize for it being this late, but um, hey, you know what? Better late than never. At least I didn't give you a show at all, so... This has been episode 14 of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are on these news stories here. Like, comment, subscribe, share them with your friends. Don't forget to check out my official website. And you can also go follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And I have decided to start posting these on SoundCloud because I've just been too lazy to um, take down the SoundCloud account. I might as well just post all these shows on the SoundCloud account and leave it up. So, yeah, SoundCloud is back. But, uh, yeah, SoundCloud, Rift.TV, Periscope. And if you love what I'm doing on this channel, whether it's movie reviews, Let's Plays, or podcasts, you can go over to Patreon.com slash TheRealMrRobinson and give out a monthly donation. So, until next week, this is The Real Mr. Robinson telling you there is only one. <laughs>